They gathered for what turned out to be their last meal at 6.48 this morning, the ceremonial breakfast. For months, they had trained together. Astronaut Allison Onizuka from Hawaii, the star of this mission, New Hampshire school teacher Krista McCullough, mission commander Dick Scobie, pilot Michael Smith, astronauts Judith Resnick and Ronald McNair, and payload specialist Gregory Jarvis. After three days of delays, they appeared tired, but quickly rejuvenated by applause as they headed for the launch pad. So, uh, by Ron McNair, and, uh, pilot Mike Smith, followed by Kristen Asala, feature in space, Ellison uh, Onizuka, and payload specialist Greg Jarvis. Final preparations before liftoff. The ground crew gives McAuliffe an apple, an apple for the teacher, and wishes of good luck. Initially, liftoff was scheduled for 9.38 this morning, but again, there were problems. A hard freeze overnight left ice on the launch pad, a two-hour delay. And then NASA discovers a faulty fire detector on board the shuttle, another hour's delay while it's replaced. Finally, the liftoff was set for 11.38. A crowd of some 500 spectators, including 18 visiting school children from McCullough's hometown of Concord, New Hampshire, waited anxiously, and then counted down. The liftoff appeared flawless. The spectators, including Krista McCullough's parents, Grace and Edward Corrigan, watched proudly through tears of joy. 65 seconds into flight, NASA Control orders Commander Scobie to go to full power. Roger, go and draw up. Roger, go and draw up. Suddenly, an explosion. My controllers here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. NASA loses all communication with Challenger, but the crowd still does not realize that something's gone wrong. Within seconds, Challenger disintegrates. We have a report from the flight dynamics officer that the vehicle has exploded. For the spectators and Krista McCullough's parents, joy turns to confusion, worry, and a realization of tragedy. The $1.2 billion spaceship, its seven crew members, and their satellite payload disappear. I thought the flight was going fine. And then I heard them say, major malfunction. And then the person beside me said, it's exploded. And it was, I couldn't speak. It was. Within minutes, emergency rescue teams parachuted in, converging on a search area 18 miles east of Cape Canaveral. The debris continued to fall for 50 minutes and more. And obviously you can't send aircraft and uh, ships into an area where debris is falling, where they, may, they themselves may be in danger. Late this afternoon, after six hours of searching, NASA reports they found no survivors. These searches have not revealed any evidence that the crew of Challenger survived. Tonight, NASA and Cape Canaveral are in mourning. Tonight at Cape Canaveral, Vice President George Bush, accompanied by Senators Jake Garn and John Glenn, both former astronauts, Express the nation's condolences. Grace and Ed Corrigan of Framingham, Massachusetts, were in the VIP bleachers along with their daughter Lisa to watch their daughter Krista become the schoolteacher in space. Their faces mirrored what happened a little more than a minute into the flight. The families have been secluded in the astronauts' quarters at the space center since just after the accident. In nearby Titusville, where the manned space program is the economy, the shock hit hard. I just started crying and backed up and walked away because I knew it was really bad. I wondered if anybody could be salvaged, you know, from something like that. That was really the first thing that went through my head. Vice President George Bush arrived here late in the day, heading a delegation bearing the nation's condolences to the families. You must try to understand the spirit bravery and commitment of what make not only the space program but all of life for you. We exploded and that uh, impact uh, in the water. Some people were covering their eyes and, and some people were just 
watch what she said with a quick look in her face. It was really quite dramatic. At first, you know, everyone was really happy, all these smiles, and then suddenly you saw a lot of people crying in the halls, and it was really pretty sad. Just moments before, Eileen O'Hara, Krista McCullough's good friend and classroom substitute, had shared this haunting sentiment with a local reporter. Yeah, it's going to be hard to watch. Because <laughs> I want her to be safe, and I want her to have fun. Now the public celebration had turned into private mourning and shock. She was a part of us. She was part of a family. And, like, if your sister or brother died, she's, she'll be remembered. It was the health. The health. Though Krista McCullough's students and friends have known her here in Concord for years, she became known to the nation when she decided to pursue her dream. Those dreams had been sparked by President Reagan's announcement a year ago for a teacher astronaut. The search for that history maker brought 11,000 applications, but only one made the final grade. And the winner, the teacher who will be going into space, Krista McCullough. From the outset, she approached this mission and her training with the same ideals she brought to the classroom. Well, it was a challenge, and it was something that I always ask my students, you know, to go and seek whatever they feel they can do and reach a little higher. She wore her spirit on her face, and her hometown loved it. Now they are remembering it. A special counselor will be brought to Concord High tomorrow to help students begin dealing with their loss. But perhaps Krista McCullough's own words echo the best advice. To follow your instincts and go for your dreams, and I, you know, I hope, hope they achieve that. Jay Shadler, ABC News, Concord, New Hampshire. When Challenger was 10 miles up and 18 miles down range and that explosion occurred, we all knew a great deal about Krista McCullough, but we've become so accustomed to the shuttle going up and coming down now that the other astronauts on board were just not as well known to us. Well, they are today, and ABC Stone Phillips has been looking at this. When they posed, it was like a portrait of America. Men and women, war veterans and first-time astronauts, parents and even a classical pianist. Their commander was Francis Scobie, age 46, from Washington State, an astronaut after 22 years in the Air Force. This was his second shuttle mission. Second in command, pilot Michael Smith, age 40, a decorated Navy pilot from North Carolina. Like Scobie, he'd seen combat in Vietnam and trained as a test pilot. And like the commander, he was a husband and father. This was Smith's first shuttle mission. Mission specialist Ellison Onizuka was the first Hawaiian astronaut who believed in the benefits of the space program. There are a lot of uh, outcomes from these projects which will affect both our society and the rest of the world. Onizuka is survived by his wife and two daughters. 36-year-old mission specialist Judy Resnick was a shuttle veteran, her assignment to operate the shuttle's mechanical arm. She was on board the shuttle Discovery in 1984 when a launch was aborted after the engines had fired. Gregory Jarvis was on board to conduct tests on the effects of weightlessness on liquids carried in tanks. Born in Detroit, trained as an Air Force satellite engineer, Jarvis was on his first shuttle mission. Ronald McNair, age 36 from South Carolina, brought a background in physics and laser technology to the shuttle program. This was the second trip to space for a husband and father who saw space travel as a calling for mankind. I see it as something that we must do, and I see it as something that's part of man's nature to explore. These six, along with Krista McAuliffe, the first teacher in space, now a tragic page in NASA history. Stone Phillips, ABC News. When we come back, we'll try to analyze what happened. It isn't easy.